If we all synced our blood sugar data with our boyfriends so that they get a warning that, hey, your girlfriend's blood sugar is nearing the 70s and 60s, give her a snack. That would save a lot of relationships, okay? I tried a continuous glucose monitor for two weeks to see if my hunger levels really correlated with my blood sugar levels because I feel like I'm always hangry and snapping at my boyfriend and also to see if my blood sugar response was normal. Now, if you don't know me, I'm Elise. I'm a 31-year-old non-diet intuitive eating dietitian here in the Silicon Valley, and I love the continuous glucose monitor because for my patients who are pre-diabetic or they just are curious about their blood sugar, instead of me telling them how many carbs to eat because I absolutely hate doing that, it gives you feedback in real time to know if you're eating the right amount of carbs or if the type of carbs is affecting your blood sugar response. Before I dive into my own data and the seven observations I made, I'm going to give you a quick crash course on blood sugar and what it all means. So sugar in the blood is just energy for your cells and your muscles. So it's always fluctuating throughout the day after eating, after you exercise, it's just changing. And this is a study that looks at 434 healthy people, no issues with blood sugar, no issues with diabetes. Let's just focus on the mean. On average, when we're sleeping in the middle of the night, not much is happening. So our blood sugar in theory is pretty flat, around 100 or so or less. And then those arrows at the bottom indicate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So if you're having toast or bread or rice or fruit or anything that has carbohydrates in them, those carbohydrate chains will break down into single molecules of sugar and enter your bloodstream. And from there, your blood sugar rises which is great because then your cells and your muscles get super excited. They see that there's energy in the bloodstream for them. So they open up their little doors and they eat up the sugar for energy. So then your cells feel energized, your muscles feel energized, and then you ultimately feel energized. Sometimes what happens is the door to the cells and the muscles don't open up very quickly. If you've ever had an old door, a rusty door, you can put in that key all you want, but the doorknob just doesn't open very quick. Now, in this case, with your blood sugar, the key is called insulin. Your body creates insulin after every meal to act as the key to open up your cell doors. But sometimes the cell door is rusty and that's also called insulin resistance. It's just resistant to the insulin because the cell doors aren't opening up very quickly. So it's just backlogged and it stays in the bloodstream. So your cells don't feel energized and you don't feel energized and your blood sugar continues to be high and doesn't come back down all the way. Some of the reasons why that could be happening is simply maybe your meals have been high in carbs for a long time. In the beginning, your body is okay with it. And over time, it just wears down that system. So the insulin just doesn't go into the keyhole as well. It's just kind of wear and tear over time. Another reason could be lack of activity. Now, the thing about activity is exercising, walking, strength training, anything can help oil up the keyhole. And usually, if you have a rusty door, the way to fix that problem is to add oil into the keyhole and lube it up. That's exactly what exercise does. Exercise, especially strength training, like Pilates, yoga, weightlifting, it just lubes up your keyhole so that the insulin goes into the keyhole faster and opens up your cell doors faster. The reason why you want your blood sugar to be in this narrow band is that way you know that you're not eating too much carbs and your body is clearing it out fast enough. All that energy is getting into your cells. You don't want it to be in the extremes. If it's always high, then eventually your blood sugar might creep up into the pre-diabetic range. And if someone has diabetes and they don't control it for decades and decades, then what ends up happening is all of that sugar that's backlogged into the bloodstream for decades on end, some of that crystallizes. Add a lot of sugar to water and heat it up a little bit. Those are the exact conditions in your blood vessels when there's a lot of sugar. And so some of those sugar crystals can act like glass shards and damage your most delicate and fine blood vessels in your eyes, kidneys, hands, and feet. That's if you've had diabetes that you haven't controlled with medication or lifestyle for decades on end. That's nothing that you have to worry about or nothing that most people have to worry about, but that's just why it's so important to keep your blood sugar in a normal range. Hemoglobin A1C is just a three month running average of your daily blood sugar. And that's because hemoglobin, also known as red blood cells, have an average lifespan of three months. Whatever sugar is lingering in your bloodstream is gonna attach onto your hemoglobin. 
And so if you're someone whose blood sugar is very high all the time for the past three months, more of the sugar is gonna latch on, so your A1C value is gonna be higher versus someone who doesn't have a lot of sugar lingering in their bloodstream all the time, their A1C is gonna be lower. In general, what's normal is if your fasting blood sugar is less than 100, and then two hours after a meal, your blood sugar comes down to 140 or less. Someone whose blood sugar that looks like the mean of that graph would have normal blood sugar. Now, onto my results. The Freeze Dot Libre is the one I'm most familiar with, the one that I have my patients use. What ends up happening is it's kind of like a little sticker with a needle coming out, and it's like a stamp that you punch into your arm, and it just like goes in. I didn't feel a thing. Once you do that, you download the free app on your phone, and then you just scan your phone to the sensor to sync it. It'll auto-populate minute by minute in real time, and you can just open up your app and see what your blood sugar is doing at all times. Observation number one, I was consistently low in the middle of the night when I was sleeping. If you go too low, it's usually not too big of a deal, but sometimes what happens if people's blood sugar gets into the 60s or 50s or 40s, you never wanna to get to the 40s, people can faint. In very extreme, very rare cases, people can go into a coma if their blood sugar dips too low. Again, that never really happens, but especially for diabetics, where their blood sugar can really oscillate wildly throughout the day, those are the people that wanna keep an eye out on very low blood sugar events. And my boyfriend always says that I'm thrashing, I could literally be like sideways in bed when he finds me, when he goes to bed. I must be like working out in my sleep or something. So maybe that's why I'm just using up a lot of energy as I'm sleeping. I never have issues with low blood sugar. I don't feel the symptoms of low blood sugar when I wake up. For me, I just felt normal, woke up with energy, I can get through my mornings, just fine another observation is i usually eat breakfast one or two hours after i wake up because first thing in the morning i don't have an appetite before breakfast i can see my blood sugar slowly increasing by a few points like if i'm waking up in the 70s by breakfast time right before breakfast it might be in the 80s so i think what my body is doing there is just taking stored sugar from my muscle and just putting some of that back into the, to the bloodstream so i can get through the day Sugar is ultimately energy, and my body just wants to make sure I have enough sugar in my bloodstream to get through the morning. And with my patients, I've seen that a lot too. My highest blood sugar levels after eating a meal is usually breakfast, which is surprising because my lunch is pretty light, but here's the thing. My breakfast, if you've watched any of my videos, you know I have my bowl of Asian porridge. It has mung beans, azuki beans, peanuts, black rice, like a one cup bowl of just pure carbs, but it's very high fiber carbs. It's kind of like oatmeal in terms of macronutrients and then a hard boiled egg. And then one of the days I had a small sweet potato, Japanese sweet potato with a hard boiled egg and nuts. On that morning, my blood sugar was like 15 points lower than when I would have the porridge. So I think the bowl of porridge is maybe just bigger than that, that small sweet potato. Plus at lunch and dinner, when I eat rice, cause I usually eat rice or noodles for my carbs, I usually like naturally just keep it to half a cup or less. I don't feel the need to eat too much more. And then with noodles, I know that I'll feel too bloated if I eat a whole bowl. So I'll probably eat usually half the amount I serve my boyfriend. So that's probably why my just portions of carbs at lunch and dinner is smaller than my porridge at breakfast time a few times a week when I feel like it. Truly, if I just have like a burst of energy in the morning, I go on like a two block run and it's literally like two blocks out, two blocks back. So like seven minutes total. Before I even started running, I think my blood sugar was in the 80s. And then the minute I stopped running, I scanned my blood sugar again and it was in the 130s. And I think it was pre-breakfast because I don't like to run on a full stomach. So fasting pre-breakfast, it went up 50 points. It has to do with probably the sugar stored in my muscle called glycogen breaking down into sugar to power me through the run. Not a bad thing, but it's fascinating what high intensity exercise does to your blood sugar. And I've seen this before with a previous patient. She would be exercising for two to three hours at a time. And in the middle of her very ex intense exercise, her blood sugar would spike, even if she didn't snack beforehand. I always say, don't always blame the food. There are a whole bunch of other things happening, like the intensity of your exercise, even sleep and stress. When we're hyper stressed and not sleeping well, 
our body feels like it's in the fight or flight mode all day. And when that happens, same thing, your body might take stored sugar from your muscle, put it back into your bloodstream to power you through the day because sugar in the bloodstream is ultimately energy versus someone that's sleeping enough and feeling relaxed throughout the day, their body is in a relaxed state. And so their blood sugar might just naturally be a few points lower because they don't feel the need to push extra sugar into the bloodstream. So those are all the background things that are happening that are not food related. Every time I did Pilates or like I usually do 20 to 30 minutes of Pilates, it is a hard workout, but it's a very calm workout. Usually I, I do it before breakfast and I, my, my fasting blood sugar is in the 70s or low 80s. By the end of my 20 minutes of Pilates, my blood sugar might be in the mid 80s or high 80s. So again, not too much of a change, much more stable than my run, but it still rises a few points because I think my body is just like trying to get me through the workout, right? Another observation that was fascinating was I had my period. I had PMS cravings off the charts one of the days. And that night I made homemade toffee. I made digestive biscuits. I had dark chocolate all in one sitting. And mind you, the portion wasn't very large. I maybe had like two squares worth of toffee and then I paired it with 100% dark chocolate because I knew the toffee was gonna be super sweet. So I had maybe yeah, two squares of toffee, one digestive biscuit and like two squares of 100% dark chocolate and my blood sugar never spiked. It just stayed in the 80s and it never deviated from the 80s. Even in the middle of the night when I was sleeping, it was in the 80s. It all boils down to the portion. You can have fun treats, you can have ice cream, you can have toffee, toffee is so sweet. And if you're sensible about the portion, I just had two squares and a very simple digestive biscuit, it didn't affect my blood sugar. And I tell this to my patients all the time, like if you had a big bowl of like quinoa and, and brown rice, that could spike your blood sugar much more than a little bit of toffee. And that's because a big bowl of brown rice and quinoa could be hundreds of grams of carbs, but just the sheer portion of it is so large. Versus two squares of toffee might only be like, you know, 20, 20 grams of carbs. Your body can easily use that up for energy and burn it up, right? At the end of the day, you can overdo a good thing like quinoa and brown rice. And you can definitely still have something that is high in sugar in small amounts and it not affect your blood sugar. This is why I love the continuous glucose monitor because it, it tells you that you can see it in real time and you don't have to be afraid of food. I would hate for any of my patients to be scared of food and sweets. You can have it in moderation and you can gauge what the right amount is based on your continuous glucose monitor. Finally, to answer the question, like when I'm hungry slash hangry, what is my blood sugar? For sure, the 60s. So usually I have dinner at six. We got to the restaurant, it was a Friday night at 6.30. They told us to wait an hour. It was 7.45 by the time we maybe got our food. So by that time I was desperately hungry. I burst out into tears, I was so hangry. And it was in that moment that my blood sugar was in the mid 60s. And there were some days that if my blood sugar was in the low 70s, also didn't feel great, feeling very hungry. What I'll say is when my blood sugar is in the 70s first thing in the morning, I feel fine, I feel great. But in the evening times around dinner, if my blood sugar is in the 60s and 70s, I feel awful. If we all synced our blood sugar data with our boyfriends so that they get a warning that, hey, your girlfriend's blood sugar is nearing the 70s and 60s, give her a snack. I was going to this adoption fair. It was like so many puppies, so there was a pho restaurant right next door. So I sat down and had my, my little solo Saturday date as my boyfriend was at EDC. And it just didn't taste good. Like it wasn't the best pho broth I've ever had. So I probably only had like a third of the noodles. It just stayed in the 80s after that meal. And that's another great example of you can eat out. You can get a noodle based dish. You can get a carb based dish. If you just eat a third of it or a half of it, I doubt it's going to spike your blood sugar. I doubt it's going to affect you that that much. Fill up your stomach with some veggies, fill your stomach up with some of the broth and some of the meat. Those are all of my observations. Now, I know that it's a luxury to get a Freestyle Libre or any continuous glucose monitor because insurance doesn't cover for it unless you have diabetes, your pancreas is failing, you can't make insulin anymore. That's the only time insurance would reimburse. So if you're paying out of pocket, every sensor would be probably about 30 to $80 out of pocket and every sensor lasts two weeks before you have to change it out for a new one. 
I think it's super fun and super worth it if you have the means. If in the past you've noticed that your blood sugar has been creeping up, or if you're close to the pre-diabetic range or in the pre-diabetic range, it's a great time to be preventative and see what it's doing. All you're really looking for is your fasting blood sugar to be below 100 and two hours after eating a meal that it comes down to 140 or less. If that's good, you're good. But if it's not the case, go on a few 15 minute walks after a meal. Switch up the amount of carbs that you're eating. Shave off like 20% of the rice you're eating or maybe see what brown rice does compared to white rice in the same amount. Play all of these fun experiments on yourself. Don't feel scared of food. See what toffee does to your blood sugar based on the amount. I know that I can have two squares of toffee. Probably will be fine, right? And also see what exercise and sleep does. A lot of these days I was averaging like 8,000 steps and on weekends I would go on hikes and I usually do 20 minutes of Pilates. I'm sure that did a lot of good for me. And if you ever want me to take a look at your CGM data, your Freestyle Libre data, definitely feel free to email me. We can set up a consultation. I am still a dietitian. We can definitely set up a nutrition counseling session for us to talk through it together, to see what your blind spots are, to see how you can improve your blood sugar. Because ultimately I want all of us to enjoy carbs fully in the right amounts for our body. I want us to be okay with eating carbs. I want us to know what, what hunger feels like and how it correlates with our blood sugar to prevent having a blow up with your partner. I hope you found this helpful. This was definitely me putting on my dietitian hat today. If you want me to put my, my dietitian hat on more for future videos, let me know. And um, I will see you next time.